the writer of this letter's goal is to teach the hearers of it that Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords. He has appeared to Moses, to angels, to the United States, to every financial security you can have, to every principality of power and darkness. Like he is all and all. And if you don't bow your knee to him, if you bow your knees to other things, you have an opportunity to repent and turn back into the beauty of who Christ King Jesus is. And so we're going to do that today. Before we get to Hebrews 3 and 4, I'm going to read Psalms 95. And the reason I want to read Psalms 95 is because a big chunk, it's 3 and 4 are going to work out of Psalms 95. Um, and so I think it's important that we um, just read what the psalmist is writing. And so Psalms 95, it says this, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hand formed the dry land. Come, Let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God and and we are the people of his pastures, the flocks under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in Meribah or as you did the day at Masha in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had not seen what I, although they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are my peoples whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. And so that's Psalms 95. Um, It doesn't really tell us specifically who the writer of that Psalms is, but I would say first century Jew would definitely put this one under David, King David. So we have this, you know, the, the very first half of this Psalms, it's a, it's, a, it's a declaration of worship. It's a declaration. It's a hymn. It's a, it's a hymn of praise of his creation and of his, and of his beauty and of his majesty. But then there's a turning point where, where, where there's a warning in this, in this Psalm. There's a warning that, 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 that says, don't harden your hearts. Be careful. And he references the wilderness. He references the people coming out of Egypt, out of slavery, who experienced the miracles that they experienced, the parting of the Red Sea. They experienced um, um, the, 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 the plagues that were, that were presented to Pharaoh in Egypt to, that, that led them to the freedom that they had. And yet, after that, beautiful display of God's power. After that amazing, um, just unbelievable, like those things, like if we could actually put ourselves there, it was out of this world, right? But it wasn't but a few years down the road where they started complaining and they started to question and they started to wonder, Moses, what did you do? Why are we out here in the wilderness wandering around? And their hearts begin to harden and the reason this scripture is important, and we're going to get into it here in Hebrews 3, is because I think it's important that these people's hearts became hardened even after the most, probably one of the greatest displays of, of power they've, this world has ever seen. And so don't just question that you don't think your heart could get hardened. For our king died and was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead. Like, if we believe that, but then we start living as though that's not true. We start living in fear. Like, if we believe that he raised, that he's the first fruit of the new creation, and that we live fearlessly against, and death has no sting over us. Do we live like that, or do we start falling back into the traps of security, safety, finances, all these things that we want before we can do our, like, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. We can live boldly for God, no matter where the circumstances, when we know whose sons and daughters we are. Does that make sense? Yeah, good. And so I think this scripture, obviously the writer of Hebrews recognized that this scripture was speaking into that existence. And that's why they use it so much. 
And so we're going to start in Hebrews 3. We're going to pick up at the very beginning here. It says, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledged as our apostle and our high priest. And so this is really important. And next week, Rachel and Justin are going to be teaching on the high priestship of who God is, who Christ is. But, but the writer here is just getting us ready. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and our high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. Who appointed him? It was the Father appointed him. Just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has great, greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses, he was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and hope in which we, in which we glory. So really, just take a pause here. One of the major reasons why they believe this, this letter was written before 70 AD is because there's really no reference of the temple's destruction. I mean, the temple in Jerusalem's destruction was a world, I mean, I mean for these people, it was a world phenomenon, like wide phenomenon. Like you knew about the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem when Rome surrounded Jerusalem and they basically starved these people out and then tore the temple to pieces in 70 AD. And so there's, a re there's no reference to that. So the, most historians will say this letter had to have been written before 70 AD. Here's one of the beautiful things I love about that though. Even before the destruction of the temple, the writers of Hebrews was looking at the followers of Christ as the new temple. It didn't, it didn't take the destruction of the temple for that to be recognized within the followers of Christ. And you're going to see this elsewhere. First Peter talks about that we are the blocks of the new. We are the new temple. We are the living and breathing blocks of the temple of God. So, the, so God is not housed in a location. We don't have to travel back to Israel and visit Jerusalem and go into the temple to experience the presence of God. Like, our, like, like, like people who follow Muhammad, who have to make the trek to Mecca in their lifetime. We don't need to, because we are the temple of God. We take him wherever we go. And we get to allow people to experience the presence of God in the, in the, in the, in the holies of holies when we open up our table to them and invite them in. Isn't this beautiful? It's so good, right? Like, we are the living, breathing stones of the temple of God here on this earth, inviting creation into the story of renewal and restoration. That's what we get to do. And we get to do it fearlessly because guess what? The principalities and the powers of darkness hate that we do it. And so they're going to fight against you. And you, like, I don't want to, like, we just don't worry about this things on this side of earth. We're, 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 we're pursuing a rest that not only is to come, but we're pursuing it now that's available now. Because we understand that the king of kings is on throne and he is doing the things that need to be done to bring all men and women unto him. That's his goal because he's so freaking good. <laughs> so, so I'm picking up in seven. It says, so as the Holy Spirit says, today is Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So he's referencing right straight to Psalms 95. The Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. So he's talking about those 40 years in the wilderness. During the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did, that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And so I love that in 10, it says they, that, that, it, that is why I was angry with that generation because I, their hearts had always gone astray for they had not known my ways. See, 
before that, I should start at nine there. When the ancestors tested me and tried, the, the 40 years they saw what, they saw what I did. So he's, he's referencing into that Psalms of 95. Like they saw these miracles. They saw what I did. They saw it with their eyes, but they didn't believe it with their hearts. They didn't believe it with their hearts. Their hearts are always going astray for they had not known my ways. See, they didn't see God as a father who was good and true and restorative and wanting to bring their, his, his sons and daughters into the fullness of who they are. They saw him as, as a taskmaster. They saw him because, probably because for 400 years, they were treated that way. They were abused and put into slavery and they, they didn't have the eyes to see or the heart to believe that God was good enough. And so because of their unbelief, even though they saw the miracles, he wasn't allowing them to enter into the rest. And it's, this isn't, yeah, I, we can talk about that more, but I mean, this isn't that God was hardening their hearts. It's that their hearts became hard and he knew that he couldn't allow that, them to enter into the promised land until that generation had, 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 had come to its fullness in the new generation could walk in its promise. Does that make sense? Yeah. See too, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a, has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as is called today, so that none of you may be hardened to sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original convictions firmly to, be, to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who, hardened the, who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So it wasn't that they, they, they weren't able to enter because they weren't good enough. It was because they weren't able to believe. They had a lack of belief in who God was. And this goes back to the very beginning of this letter, right? Believing that who Jesus said he was, who the Father said he was in the power of resurrection, who enthroned him at the right hand. Like, these are all these things that we have available to us now to see that Jesus is who he said he was by the validation of God through the resurrection power of Christ. And so when we start wrestling with with do I really believe that? And I, I know I say that, like, I, I don't know, maybe you don't wrestle with that, but like, do my actions back up what I say I believe? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the better question, right? Do my actions actually back up what I say I believe? Because I think a lot of us would say, yeah, of course I believe Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But then every four years in the election cycle, I get all nervous and worried that the world's coming to an end. And it's like, no, who cares? Uh, yeah, yeah. He's the king of kings, man. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got it under control. America isn't the great last thing on earth, right? The yeah. kingdom of God is already enthroned and it's eternal. It's the only eternal, right? right? Like if my actions fall into that trap because I watch too much of one side or the other, like, and I get all nervous and worried, you know, then, then there's something I think we need to check ourselves on. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it goes everything, and it's all different ways too. Like if, if I, I'll just get off a rabbit trail, so I'm sorry. But I think that's the, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Is my actions backing up this truth that King Jesus is king of yesterday, today, and eternity? And how do I now live my life with that knowledge? It says, who were they? Or I just read that, right? So they see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, so the promise still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, 
But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of the, the faith of those who obeyed. And so it's a question now. They saw these miracles in the wilderness before they entered the wilderness. Same thing just happened for us. We watched a man beaten, hung on a cross, spit on, tore his body apart, put into a tomb. And then three days later, he was resurrected into a new creation, into a new body. And he walked among us for some days and then ascended into heaven to sit, you know, like these are people that are literally a generation within that 40 generation time frame who experienced that. They knew people who was there with him. And so this wasn't so detached 2,000 years from them. And so these, these, it's unbelievable power of God shown on them. It says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, so the people in the wilderness never entered his rest, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. Okay, so we who believe, we get to enter into that rest. That rest begins now, on this side of eternity. But it also is more, it's more complete in the eternal um, in the restoration of all things. So it says, now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I, declare on, on, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. So what does this mean here, right? We read, we scroll back to the very first page of the Bible, Genesis 1. I feel like it always starts somewhere in Genesis 1, right? 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis 1, it says God created and God created. And on the third day, it was very good. Fourth day, very good. Fifth day, very good. But on the sixth day, or I'm sorry, it was good. It was good. It was, on the sixth day, it was very good. And then once he was done with creation, and on the seventh day, God entered into his rest. See, in his rest, work has been done. He's completed what he set out to do. He formed the universes. He formed the mountains. He brought the earth and the sea and the mountains and the land and the animals and creation. And then he invested in us and human beings himself and says, you're my image bearers. I'm going to breathe my spirit into this clay and you will be the people who, who guide and direct and nurture this planet that I've given you. And then he entered into his rest. Oh, did I lose something there? Oh, there we go. And then he entered into his rest. And then down the road, you know, Adam and Eve, if you know the story, chose to walk away from God. They chose to enter into sin. And because of their entering into sin, God had to uh, remove them from the garden because they, 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 they had to be removed from, from his holy, from not only his holiness, but if they brought that death into it, it would have destroyed creation. Because out of his love and out of his grace, he said, before they left it, I will make a way for you to return home. I will crush the serpent's head yeah. and I will be wounded in the process, but I will make a way for you to return home. And so they were removed from the garden and entered into the beginning stages of the world system. They gave away their right to be the rulers of this world. Right. They gave it over to the principalities and powers of darkness, the Satan in the garden. And he then had the keys to rule and reign. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not, go, did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. That this he did when a long time ago he spoke through David, as in the passages already quoted. So now he's referencing back to Psalms 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now it says this, for if Joshua had given them rest, so I believe there's basically three stages of rest within scriptures. The chapter one, Genesis one, Joshua entering into the promised lands, there's a rest that Israel begins to feel. 
but it's not the full rest. And we're going to get to that right now. The full rest is in the fullness and the restoration of all things in the kingdom of God. Okay? Because it says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So what does he mean by that? Well, he's referencing back to Psalms 95, right? He keeps going back to this idea that they didn't have their rest. But a good Jew in first century understands that Psalm 95 was written hundreds of years after Joshua was entering into the promised land, right? So if the writer is saying that they hadn't a rest yet of Psalms, they know that it's a future rest that is ahead of Joshua. Does that make sense? This is what the writers who have the eyes to see, this is what the followers of Jesus who see him as Messiah now have the eyes to see as they return to the story of the old covenant. They read the scriptures differently. And they can see now that the writers, and he's saying David, when he wrote this, knew that there's another rest yet to come. And he's saying that rest now belongs to King Jesus. We found the rest that they were all looking for. He's able to read, and I think we don't necessarily see that because we see all this. We, you can sit down, I mean, we've done it before. You can read through the whole scriptures in 90 days. Some people have done it much quicker than that. You can read the whole story, and it's, it is that to us, a story. But when, when it's your literal community, when these letters are written to you, and you start you know, being un, understanding that this is the bedrock of everything that your community is built, built on, you start recognizing things like, okay, yeah, well, Joshua entered into rest, but yet King David, who comes hundreds of years later, talks about a future rest. What is that future rest? Oh, guess what? I know what the new future rest is. It's in Christ King, Messiah. So if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work. So he's saying the Sabbath rest is still good. When, she, when God created the heavens and earth in six days and said, now on the seventh day, I'm going to rest. And it's still good for you to rest right. on one day a week. But don't make it into laws and rituals like they did up, leading up into Jesus' time, right? Where the rest actually becomes more of a burden to everybody. Right. It's like just... And pause and, and enjoy your life once a week. Just take a breath. For anyone who enters God rests also rests from their work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their examples of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and it is active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So, wow, right? Yeah. That's, that's a loaded scripture. It's so good. But I will make reference to this one. What I think is important is when he talks about for the word of God is alive and active. I think it goes back to what I shared earlier. The word of God he's referencing is the Old Testament to us. All right? Because the New Testament isn't, <laughs> it isn't written yet. It's in the process. It's not, and so I think there's a beauty in that, recognizing the importance that we need the full story. I think it's something we've went over for the last probably five years here. We have to understand the full story. The story is taking us someplace. Until we understand the full story and that Christ is the climax of the story of Israel, it's hard to have the faith to walk into the fearness that the world wants to throw at you. If Jesus is just a really good guy who gives me a, a ticket to heaven, yeah, yeah. if he's just that, you're going to live in fear. But if from the foundations of the world, a plan was set out and a people was selected to show the world what God looked like. And through that people, it was an invitation that all people can be sons and daughters. And you believe that story and you know that story and you have faith in that story. Then these small side stories that come along that the world wants to throw at you, you just don't live in fear over them. You live in power. And you live in pursuit for wholeness and restoration of all things. 
And you recognize the people that are blind to that, who are living and chasing down that power and control. And they want that influence. And some of them get it, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're the ones that, that just feed into it and want you to believe that they are something that they're not. And so the word of God is alive and it's active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I love that, right? Like the word of God. It would, it, it, and I also think, I, I mean, I, I love that word. I do believe the word of God is the scriptures. But I also believe John, the apostle John, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word becomes flesh. So there's two words that I think these early followers of Christ represent. Jesus Christ himself is the word of God. The gospel of John, as he's writing his gospel, recognize that, that Jesus Christ himself is the active, living, flesh and blood word of God. And what Jesus says is eternal and is all that is all. And so sharper than any double-edged sword, it separates, even divides the soul and spirit. And so he's saying that the word of God can penetrate and it will fillet you open at the end of all things. And, and you will be judged. And let me tell you, it's, it's, it's nothing to be fearful of. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to talk about that throughout Hebrews. You don't, have to, you don't have to be scared of that judgment. It's going to be a beautiful day that God's going to, he's going to read your heart and he's going to, and he's going to, you know, there's, there, I can assure you there's some chaff on me that's going to be burned up, right? But, but, but I hope there's some rubies, like there's eternal things that he's going to find in me. And he's going to, my hope is like, he's going to say, job well done. Come into the eternal rest. And that's the rest that, that we, we stand confidently into the face of, of the principalities and powers of darkness that are in this world. And so we're invited, I think, in this letter, especially, you know, I said at the very beginning of this two weeks ago when we talked about Jesus is better, Jesus is better. Everything throughout this letter continues to go back to Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the high priest Melchizedek. Jesus is better than King David. He is all those things. And he's trying, the writer of this letter is trying to get you to recognize that if you can walk in that confidence of who he is as a son and as a daughter, that we will bring into the kingdom all the people, like Kathy was talking this morning, a billion people. God is anxious for us to stand up and be who he's called us to be. The world is longing for this truth. And it's so good.